So Global Village um, was a project, or is a project, that started maybe five years ago with a bunch of um, social movement organizers. Um, and the reason we decided to start the project was because we were we were three very tired, um, single, two of them, single mom, women of color organizers, uh, burnt out with fighting the system and not having a solution. Um, so it was pretty clear that the system wasn't working for us and we were fighting against it, but it was not clear how we could live without the system. Um, so we started brainstorming and I'm going to present a little bit why we started thinking about Global Village and I hope to hear from you why you guys feel the next steps could be. We still haven't found land, um, but we have, we're in the phase where we recruiting new members um, to start looking for, for places to be. So, oops. So, Sakina is my best friend, um, and this is what she do. She um, is a director of an uh, organization called We Heal, and it's a traditional healers collective. Um, and it's dedicated to offer traditional healing to anyone who is interested, um, regardless of ability to pay or regardless of knowledge to. She didn't put it there, but if, even if you don't know what that means, if you need to feel healthier and you don't have a way to get there, she's pretty good at showing you how to get there. Um, and she began practicing in 92 and I mean, I wish she was here to explain all this. Um, she lived all over the country, and she also went to Cuba to get a degree on um, her degree. Um, that's her. She usually is that smiley, um, especially when she's out in the green wild. She lives in Rhode Island. Um, and this is us and the beach. Um, that was in a really rough time. She was there for sure. This is me. A little bit about my story. Um, sorry. The reason I came from Guatemala is um, I work as a photographer. Um, when I graduated from uh, college, um, I was one of the first uh, student crew that uh, did on the um, clandestine um, break, mass breaks after um, the revolution, and that changed my life. Um, I grew up as a middle white class um, woman. Uh, my my mother's side is pretty white and pretty privileged, and my dad's side is indigenous. Um, I grew up with my mother, um, and for me, it was really hard to understand uh, the differences in society. Um, thank you. And um, we. Uh, I started working more um, as a political activist and um, student activist in my university um, with a lot of repression, especially for being a woman and a white woman. Um, I identify as a white woman even though I was half um, indigenous. Uh, I'm 99, I had to flee the country I was working. Um, I had to make a living, and I was working as a photographer for the first, w which was the first lady in the second uh, fighting back of building, uh, and building something different. 
And one of the things that was very important for me in the side of the family that I didn't spend much time was that they actually had a, a real community. My grandparents were very poor, um, left the country when my parent, my dad was like around 17, because all his kid, all their kids came to the city to study, and my grandparents were left in the country, and they decided to come and stay with the kids. But they still have a small farm um, in a very arid, uh, hot place in Guatemala, and that was the happiest place that I had been in my life. And it was a very simple life. It was I never had to wear much clothes, and I'm not saying the global village is going to be <laughs> a naked community, but um, it was very important that the things that you were wearing or the things that you had as possessions weren't important. What was important was the people, the animals, and the relationships. So what it was important for them was that everybody would have peace, happiness, and freedom. And that for me means justice, you know? Um, and what I had in the city was oppression, disadvantage, exploitation, and unfairness. But um, we've been thinking about Global Village, what are the reasons for that? And usually it's, it's power struggle, and I think all of us know that that's probably the problem. It's not that much the money or it's the power, right? It's the, the need of <coughs> more. And it's a construction of society. And it's a society is part of the environment, um, even though a lot of people don't talk about it. You know, when we think about environment, we always think about what is out there. But environment is us who create it or who take care of it or not. So we thought this is the time. So um, what is our right? Um, I wanted to ask you before I go to the slides, what do you think is your right right now? I am, what is your right? Not what you have, but what are your rights? Like what we fight all the time in the movement. One person. So 
this is what the human rights international internationally came to. So a lot of the ones you guys say are there. I don't know, can you read? So they say to health, freedom, dignity, security, equal treatment, no matter what religion, race, color, or sex, fair treatment by the law, education, to live in a spirit of brotherhood, to marry and have children. I not agree that much, you don't need to marry, but to have children. Privacy, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, of fair wage, to work and participate in government. Um, so this is um, a symbol that I really like because it talks about those things in a symbol. Um, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do for a living. Um, so that should be very important. Um, so one of the things that we, I personally um, think was the solution, or I thought it was the solution when I was probably 19, 20, was land reform. Um, and it was very easy for me to think about that. I don't know if folks here um, know something about the land reform movement. Um, I know the big stigma in the US of land reform. Oh, this is communism, socialism, which is good to have that stigma on my point of view. Um, but for some folks, it's, it's not something you can talk about openly because then you know you get named something, and then uh, it's unsafe for you. Uh, you lose friends. Um, but um, I wanted to put it here because that has been the one of the most fundamental parts of the project. We um, we thought that just the fact that return the land. I'm not going to say to the rightful owner, but return the land to the people that can use the land and take care of the land should be one of the most important things for government. I mean, especially in this country that is so big and so rich in resources, um, I think uh, it's time to stop using resources of somebody else's and to start using your resources wisely and share it. So it's a little story or um, a little blurb of what land reform means um, or agrarian reform. I mean, it's not talking just about the land, but what the land produces and what it means to own the place where you live. Um, I mean, the city is a little bit different to define because um, the city symbolizes a little bit more capitalism and, you know, but um, in the country, it's, it's more important. So um, this picture um, means to me one of the other things that it worries a lot of us, not just in seeds, natural seeds, but also in human seeds. Um, it's a big, big campaign against motherhood and against rights of reproduction, and the big attack, I feel like the big attack right now is not just on the land and the rights of the land, but also in the rights of the woman. Um, and for me, the symbol of seeds have been very important in my life, but it's more important now that I have four children and a grandchild. Um, how important it is for me when somebody comes from the green economy part and, or the environmental side and say, well, the solution is to stop having, mostly the time is men. The solution is to stop having kids. So if we have less humans on Earth, we will we'll, we'll be better. And I agree. If somebody's spending more than what they can co contribute to the system, they shouldn't be. They sh it shouldn't be allowed. But I don't think telling people in Africa that they should stop having, or Latin America, that they should stop having kids because Americans can't afford it. I mean, I think it's a big lie. 
or to tell people of color in the US that they shouldn't reproduce because they're a burden when the big burden are corporations or rich people that are spending a lot of our resources. So I think it's a conversation that is, if you can produce what you consume, you have the right to be here. And nobody should be telling you how many kids you can have. It should be how many kids can you afford to support if you're given the good um, environment for it. I don't think I can do more than four kids. Sometimes I don't have enough time. So, I mean, I, personally, for me, it's like a challenge. Love that. Yep. <laughs> Um, but that was uh, one of the things that I wanted to share that is very important in the project. So this is the bolts and the nuts of the project. It's not just a land-based project farm. Uh, it started as um, thinking about land and, and a farm, and it came out, well, we need more things than just that. We need to create, like, a society, outside society, um, or or a group model in a farm um, that works for sustaining the other things um, within of the village. So we thought that it was important to have education center because education. Um, for for me personally, um, public education would have been great in this country if it wasn't co-opted and used for keeping um, the model of society going on. Okay, we're going to keep poor people of color uneducated so they cannot get to what they need. So they are a factory for workers. Um, so we don't believe that that's the case. I, I, we believe the kids should be educated so they can take care of the elders um, first, and second, to be educated to take care of themselves. Um, so one of the things that is important for us is uh, support the people that have been oppressed by the system and empower them and emancipate them to have a better life for themselves and by themselves. Um, we're not, um, we weren't thinking about being an NGO, and it was a big controversy of like, how we're gonna do this within the system, um, and unfortunately, the only way we can work it out is creating a nonprofit as an umbrella organization because of benefits and because of protection of a nonprofit status, um, for especially for gathering resources for education. But the rest of the stuff is just a co-op models or uh, community-owned models of businesses or small businesses. So it had three components, education, um, housing, and the farm is more like a mean of work. Uh, a dignified uh, job that will create a knowledge on the earth. Um, it's not like a, we weren't thinking about a typical farm. Uh, we were thinking something um, that could be cheaper. We're not thinking of having a big tractor and produce more gases. But going, you know, not just organic, which is like, well, you know, it's great. But if we can't afford it, we can't. But just doing it the old way, old-fashioned way, the really old, old-fashioned way. I, um, we actually, Sakina and I went three years ago to Server Village because that's what one of the places where you can see how it was the old-fashioned way, in a way. Uh, and it was great. It was great to see, like, you can do anything. You can do your own clothes. You can do it, like, it was incredible that resources are there and the knowledge is there. We don't need to invent anything new. You just ha have to go back to the old way. Uh, that's 
how it is um, in Guatemala. This picture was taken in January of this year, and this was in one of the most rural places, and they had this beautiful garden. Um, and I just say that's how I want to live. Um, because all things are important. Um, and I mean, it's the same things, just in a different order, but we couldn't decide. We now a group of 12 very involved folks, um, some in Rhode Island, some in Massachusetts. Um, and we had a big gathering last year in November. So this year, we're going to do the first year of a bigger group gathering to try to talk about how to move forward. But um, I mean, the idea was not forget that even though we wanted to do something small, something local, we have an impact outside our community, outside the country, outside the continent, and I do believe that outside the planet. Um, I, it's very selfish for me to say that we are the only species that can think about the things that have issues in the in the universe. But I will say all our members have done community organizing at this point. Um, in different things, in immigration, in health, and farm workers, and workers in general. Um, so that keep, keep us in check. It's like any anti-capitalist enterprise, we don't have money. Um, we've been looking, it's a, it's a very poor town, uh, Western Mass, called Col Rain. Um, I particularly like a lot, but it's far from some folks. But we thought pretty strongly, that's what we did our retreat, and we thought very strongly in being there. But then um, three of our members were very worried that it was a very white neighborhood. I mean, very white. I mean, it's a very small town. And I can say, when I'm in that town, I'm the only person of color. So this is as dark as, as it gets. So it's scary. Do the people in that community spend time together? Are they like spread out and just like in their homes? No, and I think that was another issue that we thought that community would collaborations that we have already talked to in um, Rhode Island and here in Massachusetts. Um, we always would like to have more organizations be in interest, especially because a couple of the parts in the project, um, sorry, the housing uh, is one of the most important ones for us, but it's probably the most expensive. Um, the land is pretty expensive, but the building of houses that are suitable and what the law would say they're good for living are very expensive and is is a lot of ways to build cheap housing but they're not allowed by the law so we thought maybe if a couple of universities are willing to in start with an endeavor we can you know build some hoods or some other kind of housings that are more simple and less fancy but suitable for the money we have but we have uh, been looking to a lot of um, land uh, base uh, buildings and um, it's one very simple that is used in California called um, smart something it's, it's like Adobe super Adobe and it's basically you just dig a hole and use the earth that is in that hole and put a little bit of cement in this sack that looks like a sugar cane sack and you fill it and it doesn't have an end so you can do as many layers around and it looked like a beehive, like a, a tree beehive. Um, but again, um, by law it's not a construction that is suitable for living, even though you can live in the streets or under a bridge because it's not living. But So those 
uh, are collaborations that we really need. And if folks can think of more collaboration, we're really open to listen. This is not my project. This is not Sakina's project. We wanted to make a project of people that want to dream with us. Um, the alliances that we were thinking to fulfill our mission was with organizations that work for people in disadvantaged communities. We are, have a democratic control. We don't have a board yet, um, but the funders are the members, and we're looking forward to have a better and a bigger um, form of government in the organization, but we need more members to be the ones building that. Um, we um, right now work very well, and we make decisions all together, and you know, probably the people that are more involved make more decisions just because all the people are less involved. And, but everybody is communicative. We do decisions. If we're going to go see land, everybody's invited. Whoever can, can. Whoever cannot, uh, trust that we're going to send the information and listen to the um, <coughs> stuff. So we are basically, the model is a co-op model. Um, there is the structure. I don't like this part. Uh, oh, not that I don't like the, the, the structure part, but it's basically um, that's the story. And um, that's how we work. Um, we have five principles and concerns. Um, and we run everything on those um, principles. And then we always use as a checkpoint the co-op principles just because they're there and they're very easy to follow. Um, but we don't um, have uh, any bigger <coughs> you know bylaws or anything yet because we want to grow at least to 30 folks be core members and to start the project. Uh, we have seed money right now and we have um, I have been working full time now uh, doing the research for the last three months on this and you know have gathered where we can get funding what kind of land would be useful um, so we're looking for something between 20 to 150 acres depending on the amount of people that want to leave in there so we need to make you know, the people that come just need to make the decision if they want to live there or just want to be part of it as a quasi co-op member. Make this proposal to some of the residents of Coleraine. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think they'd respond? So, funny to say, um, my boyfriend's family owns 100 acres. When I make the proposal of buying the land trust, um, the project buying the land trust, they uh, actually um, they decided that no, they were not use it. They have a hundred acres and they use three acres. Um, so that for me was like a response of people that know me, and he is owner of the trust. It's part of the trust. So I feel like is a still a lot of xenophobia in the US. Um, with a lot of right to have it. Because white folks have done a lot of stuff and they don't want to lose it or have a lot of stuff. And, they, and the fear of losing it must be huge. Um, agrees it's like the distance is no, I think we, it's a group, a very strong group. It's usually the group that wants to live there, they're ready to move whatever it is um, in, in New England area. Um, no, I, th I think it's just to find the right amount of uh, land for the right price. Administration neighborhood you're talking about. Um, at the moment, what is happening is, um, a group of volunteers have uh, identified 15 potential uh, neighborhoods. 
that's been now narrowed down to eight neighborhoods, um, of which at some point five neighborhoods will be uh, entered into a dialogue as to whether they would want to apply to be uh, the project, and applying simply means that they would have to do the project. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not somebody who's going to come in and do it to them or for them. Um, the residents of the community would have to do it. So um, once five communities have requested to be considered and one is selected <coughs> basically based on the stability of a, a core of people in the community to do the work, then the process will, if you will, begin in earnest. But what's the project? that they would, that you're saying would be implemented in the neighborhood? They would identify the problems of the community and they would identify then the solutions with consultative help uh, and consultation on uh, what funds might be available to assist them in that effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons we look for for rain is because when I went to the list in Massachusetts of the poorest towns, and I'm happy to say when I think about poorest, I always think of people of color because that's my experience, or women or minorities. Um, and it was, in a way, it was a minority because there's a lot of farmers, but it's more cows and cold rain than people. So. Um, that's why it, it piqued my interest. Uh, the one you identified, it's called the meeting school, I'm familiar with it. Um, approaching them and saying, could we get a 99-year lease? Well, I think we have had a lot of people talk to us about leasing, but it, for us was very important, the land ownership. Just in a stand-up point of, you could get a 99-year lease with, with a, um, a contract to be able to purchase it at a certain price uh, or simply to meet the price of a competitive bid for And I, I think a lot of people will be really in, the, um, in the group will be very happy even if it's a, a, a lease, a 99-year lease with an option to buy after the 99 years because it's not that we are wanted to have the land and own the land. It's more like um, what it means on reparations for folks that have lost their land. Mm -hmm. And also because the co-op, the idea of co-op members, when we did a, we did a survey in, in the school that I, um, I'm, I'm a board member of, of ESOL school, and we run a, sur a survey to them, to the students, 99% of them are immigrants. Um, they say that even though they have been here some form between less than a year to 25 years, that they're going back. But the issue, the reason they can't go back is because they don't, they, they cash poor, because they've been investing in renting or in, in stuff that they cannot cash out. So one of the ideas is to have, in the project, to have a 10 year ownership. So you will buy, this 10 year house, or for 10 years you will be part of this house and then you can cash out some money so you can either start your business or go back and start your business back in your country. So the idea was like also to give the opportunity to immigrants to go back home with some solid base. And the idea of why we have the international farm farms ready is to have a place where they can go back and work. So, I mean, that's one of the, the parts of, the, of being international. Um, the intentions, not just like um, the exchange, which is great, and the social part of it, you know, to work together, um, but also to create a solution for folks that really, it's just a lot of folks that want to go back but don't have a way. They're like tied up in this system that one payment short to be out, you know, they stop working, they stop eating, basically. And that's the, that's how it happened to all of us that came here with nothing.
where we worked out we're supposed to discuss those like three questions mm -hmm. and get answers from everyone in the audience. Mm -hmm. Should I read them out or do you want to read them out? No, you have to do them. No, you should read them. Cool. I guess in every workshop, we're supposed to collect notes on these three and then share them all together at the end of the conference. Um, so the first question is, in this session, what areas of the green solidarity economy did the ideas address? And to write down notes from everyone here on this question, um, what areas of the green solidarity economy did the ideas in our session address? Mm -hmm. 
and the way we operate, the methods of how we operate, are all patriarchal. Even when we are again them, they're still sort of festering inside of us individually and as a, a culture. And I think this it has been trying to be a just, I, I think that was another thing that we had a big pile of on, on why the, the, the feminist movement um, didn't grow as big as it should have. And I think because it's rooted in man. And I mean, unfortunately, we cannot have a one-sided solution. I mean, if, we, if we're going to turn into be what we pay, so I, I think is is I don't think we can have just one solution written by women. I think we have to be written by everyone. Initiatives adjust in your session could be expanded to include or support other aspects of the solidarity economy. Uh, these are hard questions. <laughs> um, I think. One of the ideas that I was thinking about earlier in the morning was um, about uh, bringing more people into the ideas of cooperative living and things like that. And I guess like an inherent vulnerability to starting a community over here and being far away from the city and other things is that you won't be exposed to other people every day and like see new people and ring people on. Um, do you think? Or have you like considered um, how you're going to interact with the existing capitalist society? You're going to have like, a commodity crop or like some something to bring back to the city and like different people, or so the the idea the idea was not having. Uh, we do have those connections very intentionally there because um, even though we believe that the place to live is out there, um, a lot of folks are not ready to move. Just, oh, let's go live in the wild and we're going to survive and we be happy. That issue. The barriers and areas of convergence. It seems like all these questions are really messy because when you discuss them, you end up discussing all bits of the questions at the same time that they converge and stuff. And it's just, it's so easy to say capitalism because then yeah. you, you can, you know, it, in capitalism it's all these things, it's oppression, it's repression, it's exploitation, it's like, you know, put a price to things that shouldn't have a price. So I, I mean, for us, has been really, really a rethinking how to create something new in a society that is still not ready for post-capitalism. I don't know how to call it. Um, I mean, we cannot uh, close our eyes and say this is not happening. You know, I'm in La La Land now, and I'm, so I think understanding the way capitalism works has been the ugliest part for me to, to face in a business. Like, well, you have to make business happen. We, we, did, we didn't want to be like a nonprofit that would have to beg government or beg people to help us. We wanted to be empowered enough to make money to support this project and then get to a point that we didn't need to make money anymore. But until then, we have to make money. And I mean, the business plan, I didn't talk about it because I didn't thought that was the most important part, but it has been the most burdensome for a lot of us, you know, to create something that we think is going to bring money back and feed people and pay people well, or at least make people be able to sustain themselves, but at the same time we thought about all the things that we can't provide so we don't have so they don't have to spend money on that. If you have a house you don't have to pay rent. Right? If if you have a big crop in the back of your house you don't have to pay for food. Um, we 
or we have two or three people that work in uh, energy efficiency stuff. So like we're definitely gonna be in zero net three um, out of not off grid because it's like again creating this illusion that we don't live in this real world and we need to be connected um, happily and maybe um, explain to folks how how that works and how much we are spending. And how much we create, which is important. It's an important conversation to have. Um, but I don't know. We haven't addressed a lot of stuff. There is this public, public land, right? We try to uh, ask for public land, but you cannot live in public land in many places. So uh, you can farm in some places, but the idea was, and, and it's funny because in other countries, if it's public land, is used for public purposes, and you can have public housing. You know, you would think, you know, but well, here public. I just look in India. So India right. have never get to land um, before, so it's a very big uh, problem in the peasant and small farmer, and but in China, the they did allow this uh, land reform. So first, the, I mean, see, after the communist uh, party um, get the power, so the uh, taking the whole land in, uh, became the national property. Mm -hmm. So everybody had the same the share of the land. But they found that the uh, production is not so good because everybody, uh, I mean, it's not so, how does it, the resource looking very fair, but it's here. Uh, the production is it's not good, then we cannot, um, how to say, stimulate people's uh, positive um, to make a profit. Mm -hmm. So the, now they, they just to make divided small pieces to the, each family. Mm -hmm. And then look at these small fa uh, farmers, they have their own land. But they don't have the, um, the ultimate to the ownership of that. But they can, they can manage it and they can rent. Mm -hmm. So, so the the small uh, I mean the petty farmer they they have the mm -hmm. like you know, ownership but they cannot uh, purchase I mean sell the land mm -hmm. but they can use and manager and rent. So the I think it's the uh, it's also because the um, it's big problem say for the uh, very particularly the immigrant and people's policies. Domestic people maybe they don't have this kind of issue. Mm -hmm. But the, and I look at the uh, American farmers uh, and land. Mm -hmm. They have a, and it's because the, the resource of the land is so big. So the farmers, look at farmers, I've been to different North Carolina, South Carolina, they have a huge land, but they do not use it. Actually, they, they're just a rest. So they just to use them maybe in one year, at least in two years. So for the public resource, actually they do not use it so much. So this, for the, I mean, if you're talking about a global issue and some food issues, I think this is very west. Because some, it, it doesn't mean if you land do not use, that is the management of that. It means the land is not a good. If you have an opportunity to use management, but the, in the other part of the uh, country,